Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. So I'm going to go ahead and kick off. Uh, today I'm talking about Google Workspace Security and Incident Response. A lot of this research came based off of my work with SANS, and so I'll already give a shout out. If you'd like to see more of this kind of content, definitely head over and check out 5409. Quick introduction on myself. I have a master's in digital forensics and a secondary master's from the SANS Institute in information security engineering. I currently work as a senior security engineer at IBM working on detection engineering. As mentioned, I'm the co-author of 4509 Enterprise Cloud Forensics and Incident Response. And then outside of my work, I do act as the CFO of Mental Health Hackers. So you can look us up if you're interested in learning more about that. And I do public speaking like this. So let's go ahead and kick off. The way I've broken down this talk is I decided after giving you an intro into what Google Workspace is, we're going to look at common attack types that users, enterprises that use Google Workspace may face and break down those each of those attack types into multiple stages. I'm going to tell you how to prevent those such attacks. If prevention fails, how do you detect the attacks? And once attacks are detected, how do you respond to those attacks? For those of you who don't know, Google Workspace is very similar to Microsoft's 365. It is a software as a service. It's a suite of business tools. It takes Google services such as Gmail, Calendar, Drive, and provides them in an enterprise solution. So businesses can use this to have it as their email service, shared file storage. Like I said, very similar to what Microsoft 365 does, which is the more well-known platform. But Google's a growing business. Uh, Workspace has billion, uh, millions of corporations that they work with. And so it's still a very important topic to highlight. And that's why 4509, we decided to expand the course to not just include Microsoft 365, but to delve into Google Workspace. A lot of the, there's, Dozens and dozens of tools, basically any Google tool is provided within this suite. A lot of times incident response though, we're gonna focus on the core services that most organizations use. That's why I'm gonna focus on today, tools like Google Drive and Gmail, especially your file storage and your email solutions. I'm not gonna delve into the differences between the different versions and of Google Workspace, but it is important to note that it is a subscription model and obviously the higher tier subscriptions that you pay for may provide more services. If there's something that I bring up that is restricted to kind of those enterprise and premium accounts, then I might mention it. But in order to see the full capabilities, you'll want to research to see what you have access to. Most of this stuff, though, can be done from all versions. There's just a few items that are considered premium. So let's dive into the core of the presentation. Like I said, we're going to go through each attack, break down the prevention, detection, and response phases. Um, so these three attack types, they are covered in 4509 as the three core um, focuses of how we present our material on incident response and digital forensics. Specifically, business email compromise, OAuth abuse, and data exposure. So the first one that we want to look at is business email compromise. If you're working in a corporation as an incident responder, this is probably, regardless of platform, going to be one of the most common attacks you see. Very common, uh, long-standing history, obviously, with email being so core to businesses. So it's definitely one of the ones we want to focus on for Google Workspace. Looking at the attack chain as the attack chain kind of maps to, to our prevention, detection, and response, business email compromises begin with the compromise of credentials. This is often through social engineering. With a platform like Google, where they host the authentication, the the um and the login, you're not gonna see as often things like brute force attacks only because Google has so many built-in security controls. If you try 
even on your personal account to log in with the same email and 100 incorrect passwords, you're going to be locked out very early on. So the brute force type attacks aren't going to be as common, um, but social engineering will get you. And so once those comp credentials are compromised, the attacker will often try to establish persistence. That may be via a auto forward email. That's one we see very commonly in software as a service uh, business suites like this. Um, they'll set up an email that all your email, all the email of the compromised account is forwarded to an external account. And that way, even if they lose access, they'll still have access to the emails that you receive. They may also, if they compromise an admin, they may create a new admin account and they could share files from Google Drive to an external account, similar to emails, or they could enable 2FA so that even if you reset the, if the user resets their password, they still can't access it without the 2FA that the attacker has enabled. And then finally, we have actions on objective. This can vary by the attacker, obviously the different motivations for different attackers. So you may have an attacker who's looking to gain access so that they can use the compromised email to compromise other accounts using uh, existing email chains. Uh, they may use your account to spam. They may want to access Google Drive and steal files, proprietary information. So that's going to vary, but there's certain indicators we can look for for each of those things. Once we figure out which account is compromised, we can use the logs to figure out what the attacker did upon entering the environment. Of course, our first goal is to prevent an attack. We don't want to start by preparing for a response. We want to start by hoping we never need to respond. So obviously, there is tons of things you can do to prevent. I'm going to highlight kind of the two to three key points in each of these stages for the attack that will reduce the likelihood of it occurring. First, if you're in security, you've heard it, enable multi-factor authentication. An attacker can do nothing with the username and password that they steal if they then need a second factor uh, owned by the, the user of the account. So of course, in more advanced attacks, you could, you could do SIM swapping if SMS is used. You could try and social engineer the two-factor code, but the timing of that has to be right. So I, a, a lot of people will be like, oh, but SMS isn't secure. I think it's worth noting that you have to take into account the threat model. Um, if a person is trying to just access your account to use it to spam other accounts, they're looking for the quick wins. They're mass blasting out phishing links, hoping someone will give in. When they encounter 2FA, they're probably gonna give up because it's not worth the, the effort that it takes to also compromise a second factor. So even if you are targeted by, uh, it, sorry, even if a, a more advanced threat actor is willing to use that multi-factor authentication, is willing to social engineer you, the chances of that are much, much lower. That's a very specific threat model. And in the end, multi-factor authentication is going to have a major impact on reducing the threat of phishing attacks. So it's worth it even if um, it's not the perfect solution. The second is enabling advanced email protection. This is a service built in um, to Google Workspace that admins can enable. It essentially is just pre-delivery scanning and advanced phishing and malware protection. So it's almost like built-in email security and appliance. It's just basic scanning. It can't be super tuned. Obviously, you have to take into account the chance of impact to business. You want to test this before you just enable it. Make sure that there's no emails in your environment that are going to be delayed or blocked by the service. But as long as it doesn't have an impact to your business, um, that is, is to be of concern. It's another step, again, just adding another wall that has to be got through in order for the phishing email to arrive. And then lastly is to manage the password strength. Google Workspace administrators can enforce a password strength 
a minimum and maximum strength requirement. So this isn't enabling a uh, password expiration or a minimum length or a minimum number of special characters. This is a strength algorithm. Um, if you've ever been on a website and you're signing up and you're typing in the password and it has that red, yellow, green bar telling you whether it's weak or strong, it's essentially enforcing a person to fall into that range. So whatever Google considers strong. Uh, and the, the awesome part about this is that from the admin console, you can also access a dashboard with a very clear graph that, and table that tells you the strength of your users. So even if you didn't enable this from the beginning, when you do enable it, you can also look at who has weak password set and force a password reset so that they have to comply as soon as you decide to implement this. So highly recommend it. Most organizations will require it with other services. A lot of online services and force password strength. There's no reason your organization shouldn't be doing that either. But let's say all these controls fail. Somebody got through, they compromised the account, the attackers in the environment. Our next phase is detection. We can't respond until we detect it. If we don't know it's happening, there's nothing to respond to. So we wanna make sure detection is in place. In order to do that, we need to set up and review our security alerts. So Google has a bunch of default rules and alerts that they can enable, that you can enable, and they all go to a dashboard in an, a thing called investigation tool and a security dashboard where you can look at the alerts. This may be suspicious login activity, uh, files being shared that shouldn't be, it's important that you regularly review those alerts. Obviously, it's no good setting them up if no one ever looks at them. So in order to properly detect, you need to set up and you need to have that operating procedure in place that tells you to go and look at those frequently, your security team or your IT team if you don't have a dedicated security staff. And then the audit logs are going to be the first source of logs that are going to indicate potential business email compromise. We have various application logs. We have Google Drive, email logs, et cetera. But the most likely place that you're gonna first detect an attack is within those audit logs. Um, the, the login audit logs are going to be the most useful. So seeing when users logged in, um, unfortunately there's not geolocation, but there is IP addresses. So if you were suspicious, you could geolocate IP addresses, see if there's logins from suspicious locations. Um, you can see when 2FA has failed or passed. So you may be able to see someone failing to get 2FA a bunch. And so just looking at those audit logs and detecting any activity that may cons be considered abnormal. And then once you've detected the attack, you need to respond to it. What's really cool is you can force sign out victim users from all their devices, browsers, et cetera, if they're logged into Chrome, the Gmail app, wherever. So once I know that John Doe is compromised, the first thing I wanna do is sign John Doe out of every account from every system before they have the ability to do any further damage. With that user out of the system, I want to check for signs of persistence. Like I said, have any email forwarding rules be created? That is actually appears in the audit logs. So you can see that from the audit logs if the user uh, set up a forwarding address. Other events in the user activity logs include things like changing passwords, enabling 2FA. That can tell you if they're trying to keep access to the account. Um, you can look at the Google Drive logs and see if they shared any files with external users, things like that. So in our uh, first lab of our new day of 4509, you work a business email compromise. And these are uh, those are some of the things you check for. We have logs um, throughout which there's scattered activity related to a post uh, compromise activity. So you look for things like auto forwarding being set up, account settings being changed, et cetera. And then finally, this is kind of a broad uh, action that you do for any account compromise on any platform in any environment. 
but you can do it easily via the Google Workspace admin portal. You want to reset those account passwords uh, so the attacker can't just log back in with that same password. I want to move on to our second scenario, OAuth abuse. For OAuth abuse, it sounds a lot more complicated as there's uh, kind of application development involved. The attacker, in order to perform, carry out this kind of attack, first needs to develop the OAuth application. That sounds complicated, but there are simple instructions, there's example code and everything online. Um, I had never done this before. I was developing the lab for the course on OAuth abuse, and it took me about 10 minutes to learn how to uh, create an OAuth application, uh, write some simple Python code, put it into a script and do it. So uh, for mine, I created just an OAuth application that would that the user would authenticate. They, after authenticating and approving, the application would pull all the email addresses down that the user um, queried, sorry, that the user had interacted with. It would get a listing of Google Drive files and it either try and share or download those files. So basically anything you could do with the Google API, which is about anything you could do in the portal, uh, you know, in the applications themselves, the attacker can do essentially under that account without actually knowing the password. And so what this looks like is uh, whenever you use something that has single sign on and it redirects you to that Google login page, you are on a legitimate Google login page and you do everything looks right in terms of look at the URL, make sure it says Google and all of that is correct. But by clicking OK, you're giving that malicious application. So once you've developed the application, you have to convince the user, of course, to execute it and click OK on the approval. Um, I'd say getting them to execute the application is the harder part, but once they've executed it, then a pop-up thing says log continue with your Google account. And we know we love to just hit OK without reading. So especially if they've already been convinced that they should open the application, they click on OK. And now the attacker can execute API calls with their permissions. And that leads to the actions of objective. They're going to do whatever they can um, with those actions, uh, with those API calls. So gather emails, send emails, download files, create files, share files, uh, interact with calendars, anything that you can do via your Google Workspace portal and those applications you can probably do with an API call. And uh, these tokens remain valid for a decent amount of time, so they could reuse the tokens. So this isn't just a uh, hypothetical. We've seen APTs such as PwnStorm uh, use this before in attacks in order to carry out actions against uh, Google accounts. In order to prevent OAuth abuse, there's a few things we can do. The first, I said how I was able to write a program and carry out this thing in 10, 20 minutes uh, myself. The reason I could do it so quick partially was because when you are developing an application using Google services and Google OAuth, if you want to bypass the Google review security review process, it's marked as kind of like a development app. It's this less secure app. So Google has not vetted it. They have not approved it and signed it or anything like that, but they allow you to run it without it going through that process. So you can disallow apps that have not gone through the official Google review process, and that's gonna reduce your chance of your uh, users executing an application that you don't want them to, that they just were social engineered into loading. Of course, if your organization uses those kinds of uh, pre-approval apps or in-house developed apps, that might not be an option, but in most cases, that should be a setting that you are choosing. The other option is OAuth whitelisting. 
This is very similar to application and software whitelisting white on endpoints. You're basically saying only these specific applications using OAuth uh, can, can be used with your corporate account. And so again, that becomes a thing of, is the worth a work that goes into that um, worth it? Like, is the business impact too much? So if you have a bunch of OAuth applications and you're okay with users using OAuth, you prefer they use that to creating accounts elsewhere, um, but you don't really have a good handle on what people are using it for, this may be infeasible. But if there's just a few apps, a, a manageable list of applications that you want to allow users to use OAuth with, um, then it's a way to greatly restrict the chance of uh, OAuth token being issued to an attacker. As we continue, once again, you'll see this reoccurring theme. We hope to prevent. We can't always prevent. And sometimes we have to rely on our detection capabilities. So how can we detect OAuth abuse? First, there's a place in the portal for third-party app access review. Basically, an entire list is shown of all the applications that any user has ever granted access to their account. And it will also go into detail about what permissions were granted. Um, this may be helpful in, in terms of if there's an application that you would be okay with them using OAuth with, but it's asking for strange permissions. You've pro potentially, if you're in security, have seen the research on things like Android apps where, you know, it's a virtual keyboard or virtual piano app and is asking for access to all your contacts and your camera and your text messages. Um, so look at things like that. You may be okay with the, the user giving uh, OAuth permissions to DocuSign, you know, to just log into the account but then DocuSign potentially wants access to read files from Google Drive, and that may become an issue with uh, your corporate policy on sharing data. So not only can you review any apps that we're given access to, but also what permissions. And so I definitely recommend your security team going and looking at the, the list and seeing if anything stands out, any thing like potentially social engineering. For example, I talked about the PwnStorm APT attacks. I believe their OAuth application, they named it something like corporate security application. Like it was something that was supposed to make users think, oh, this is from my business, I should open it. So looking through that OAuth list, seeing something like a business name security app, if you don't run a in-house OAuth based security app, then that's something that you should immediately look into. And then aside from the pretty pre-built dashboard and reviewing that access, you can dig into the token audit logs. And the token audit logs basically record not only any time a token is issued or revoked, but any time that token is used to make an API call. Um, it will record what API call was made. So not only will it say that the app was granted the permission, you'll see a log then after that says, okay, after it being granted permission, that token was used to send an email or that token was used to download files from Google Drive. And from that point, you can pivot to your other logs. You can start looking at um, what was done. And that's kind of moving into the response phase, reviewing those token audit logs. I have a hit here in the same place because that's how you're going to then pivot to find out what really happened. If a token was used to download a Google Drive file or the, the Google Drive API download function was called, I guess you could say, using that token, then now you want to go look at the Google Drive logs and say, okay, at that time, what file was downloaded? And then it's really easy, just like how you can kick um, accounts, sign out users on all accounts. You can also review uh, review the OAuth tokens that have been issued and from the portal immediately revoke tokens. And once tokens are revoked, they can no longer ever be used to carry out the activities uh, that were previously carried out. So prevents future issues. Obviously, you still need to 
um, figure out what happened and remediate any post-compromise actions that were taken. But this is making sure that the compromise doesn't, doesn't just happen again. Lastly, I wanna move on to our third and final common attack scenario. I go into a bit of detail here first. Um, that exposure, I don't really have an infect, uh, a, a kill chain, a uh, compromise infection chain like I do the others. I wanna just mention that this can be accidental or malicious. Um, it could be malicious in the sense combined with an email compromise, for example, an attacker then shared files, stole files. It can be accidental. Um, it could be a user. I, I mean, I know sometimes I'm lazy with sharing Google Docs, like I'm not gonna type in 30 email addresses, so I just create a shareable link. Maybe a user tried doing that and they accidentally set it to anyone on the web instead of anyone in your organization, for example. So it may be accidental, but it's still something you need to know about. It could be a malicious insider. Um, so there's a few scenarios. You can't uh, exactly call data exposure an attack, um, but in terms of the security team's responsibilities, you need to make sure your organization is secure and whether accidental or malicious data exposure is a threat. I'm gonna focus a lot on Google Drive in this section, just because as organizations often using Google Workspace, they'll often use Google Drive to store their files. And files are the data that we're at that is most able to be exposed. I mean, there's email data, calendar data, those kind of things. They might be exposed, but in terms of accidental or malicious exposure, we're gonna focus on the corporate data within Google Drive. And like I kind of implied with the accidental side of things, a lot of times where we're gonna see this data exposure is incorrect permission settings, whether purposely set to be wider than intended or accidentally set to be wider than intended. We wanna uh, make sure that all our permission settings are resolved. So in order to reduce the chance of data exposure, we have a few options. The first one is enabling DLP. This is where I have to give that caveat of the different versions of Google Workspace. Not all subscriptions levels provide these the same DLP capabilities. So this may be dependent on your subscription. But if you do have the ability, definitely, definitely recommend enabling DLP. And even if you don't enable it to fully block DLP activities, you want to at least enable it to alert. For those of you who don't know what DLP is, it stands for data loss prevention. And basically in terms of explaining how it works is the system will monitor for certain keywords or patterns that it considers sensitive. So for example, social security numbers all follow a specific format, email addresses, phone numbers, all of those things have a recognizable format. And so if there's a document that contains, you know, something that matches a credit card number, they are able to see that and alert and say, hey, there's a file named this in this location. It's been shared externally uh, and it has uh, credit card numbers in it, or an email was just sent containing social security numbers. And so it's just kind of warning you that there's potential exposures. Just because I email a coworker, a, you know, a list of uh, social security numbers in an email doesn't mean it's been exposed wider, but obviously there's that risk. We prefer not to be sending them. They should be encrypted because if one of those accounts is compromised, so is the plain text email of social security numbers. So something to, to definitely enable, at least get alerted on, if not block it completely. That again, depends on the business impact, depends on what you know upper levels willing, are they willing to block anything like corporate policy is don't send it, block it. Um, and hopefully false positives is low, or are they worried about business impact? And so let's just alert and monitor. The second step is to restrict sharing. 
I mentioned, you know, that that habit of hitting share and just saying anybody would link and, you know, don't really pay attention to the notifications. And then uh, you you see that uh, it's actually shared to anyone with the link as opposed to anyone that uh, has it's in the organization, for example. So you can, as an administrator of Google Workspace, restrict those sharing permissions so that a user doesn't accidentally or purposely share it outside of the organization. You can restrict sharing to only be with those in the organization. You can restrict it so that you have to explicitly share it, you know, with certain email addresses opposed to just creating a shareable link. And then, the final thing I wanted to mention, just because of how big a threat it can pose, and we even go into this uh, specifically in both labs and content in 4509 because it's so significant, is Google released both to purpose, you can do this with your personal account and corporate accounts, a feature called Google Takeout. And this has been part of that kind of idea in the news of like data portability, like I want to switch to Microsoft as a user, you know, I should have the ability not to be, you know, 10 years of my data locked into Google. So Google allows you to essentially export all data in your account. And I've looked at these exports and it's crazy the data in there. You can download, you'll see a folder for maps where you can see any location that you've, uh, they've ever documented you being at for location tracking on maps, um, a logs of all your emails, you, you know, all the emails you've ever sent, every file in your Google Drive, all can be exported with the click of a button. As you can imagine, if you have an angry employee who decides that they're just going to steal all their corporate data and take it with them, uh, that is not great. Uh, or not even an angry insider threat, but an attacker. Like if I'm an attacker and I want to come in and I want to steal data, why am I going to go to Google Drive and download each file individually or go to emails and read each email individually when I can hit export and get a zip file that contains all the data I want. So hopefully you guys can see the threat that that poses. Well, it was made in good faith by Google so that you could switch environments without being locked in by a vendor. Um, it's the best data exfil capability ever for attackers. So you can disable this as an administrator. And as an admin, if there were some edge use case where a user ended up needing to export all that data, um, you can, as an admin, do the export for them. So you could re-enable it briefly, do that takeout, get them their zip and be done. Um, I can't really think of a use case where an enterprise organization would want every user across the organization to have the ability to export all of the data they have access to in a zip file. Um, so maybe there's a use case. I mean, tell me if there is a use case, but as far as I'm concerned, I believe that uh, that is something that you definitely want to disable. Moving on to our second phase, you guys have the theme now we want to detect. Like I said, if you enable DLP, you can pretend and you're not directly blocking, or even if you are blocking, you'll still get alerts talking about, hey, this is the sensitive data we saw. This is where we saw it. This is how it was shared. Definitely want to review those alerts. Even if you allow sharing of it's a certain data, maybe you don't care about a spreadsheet with, you know, vendor phone numbers um, being on the drive. Like it's good to know it's there and to acknowledge it because one, every once in a while something will show up that is significant that you need to get under control. Um, you could detect an actual attack via this if you start seeing, you know, files being downloaded that have social security numbers in that you don't think should be, um, emails being sent. So you, this is your place to start seeing what kind of activity is happening there and doing that. And then the second is monitoring the Google Drive logs. Like I said, 
tons of data exposure is going to be focused on Google Drive because there's so much data there and it's the method of sharing data in organizations. So the things to look for there, it will record any time sharing on a file is shared. You can see the old visibility and the new visibility. Um, so something may go from private to shared with a specific user, um, or you may see it go from sh shared with a specific user to shared with the entire uh, to anyone with a link, which is high exposure. And you'll even see sometimes you can publish files to the web. So not just do people, not only um, can anyone see it with a link, but it will actually be indexed in Google search results. People can find it without having prior knowledge of the link to it. So looking for those kind of sharing activities, especially since it provides like the file name and the folder. So um, maybe it would make sense for a marketing folder to publish certain uh, marketing materials to the web. But if you see, you know, 2022 Q1 budget from the finance department published to the web, uh, there's probably something worth diving into there. Once you identify that kind of data exposure occurring, you can begin to respond. So first is to review that data access. Um, it's good chance if somebody's, you detect someone sharing something with a link to anyone, it's really possible that that's how they've always shared things and this is the first time you're detecting it. Um, you know, so, so you can start looking at files who has access and it's super easy there's a dashboard available, which you can use to uh, get a high level statistical view of your files. So it'll say, okay, there's 400 Google Sheets files in your drive, uh, 300 of them are private, 50 of them are shared, and 20 are published to the web or whatever. And so you can quickly scan down and look for anything you might find interesting. So obviously you don't need to review all the private files, but you can drill down into the public files or, you know, you only care about documents, you don't care about PowerPoints, that kind of thing. So it gives you a starting overview to assess kind of what your organization's situation is in terms of your data exposure. And then you can drill down into really investigating specific incidents. And then, I, as I mentioned, the same with monitoring those Google Drive. And you'll see a few times in this presentation, I had the audit log information on both detect and respond. And that's just a case of using it to identify an attack happened for the first time and then reviewing the logs to um, figure out details of the activity. So uh, you see a file was shared. Well, is there a secondary log for unshared? Maybe someone realized the mistake they made. Um, or you saw a file was shared to the public and now you see that it was edited by a non-corporate account. So following that trail of logs to identify the full scope of the data exposure. So those were kind of the three, I, I like to put it in the perspective of the attacks. Like I said, we do it the same way in 4509 um, with the specific purpose of Google Workspace as a business tool suite, there's going to be these common attacks, um, especially the software as a service model. You have to think about the shared responsibility model. Another thing you'll learn at, about in probably most of SANS cloud security courses, Google does a lot on their side. They're not going to allow brute force attacks via their login service. Um, there's not, you know, they're going to handle vulnerabilities in their applications. You don't have to worry about um, patching your systems as cloud service. They're going to patch it, that kind of thing. So there's this shared responsibility model. And um, but so so it kind of restricts what an attacker can do at some level. And that's why I focused in on these incidents and what you can do to prevent the most common attacks. Um, you're never going to be perfectly secure. I can never promise that there's a specific set of settings that will mean that you'll never be attacked. Um, but our whole point as security analysts and defenders is to try and limit those attacks as much as possible. Um, we can't get 100%, but 90% is better than 20%. So we're going to do our part. 
So I wanted to just mention a couple other things that weren't specifically mapped to an attack, but actually will help overall um, against most attacks. First, Google has this amazing, um, it, you, all you have to do is search Google security checklist, Google workspace security checklist. They've put together literal checklists, step-by-step -step things of what your organization can do in order to secure their Google workspace instance. And they actually break it up into two checklists. So they have one that's kind of, uh, one that is a small business. So like one to 100 users. Um, and then they have a medium to large business that's for anyone with a hundred plus users. And that's just broken down in terms of like the, what would potentially need more of a, um, security team. So like, for example, the OAuth whitelisting, that's more of a heavy lift if it's just an IT team doing security things, whereas enabling password strength, your organization should be doing that even if it's just a small IT team versus a dedicated security team. Definitely recommend checking those out, doing as much as possible. For setting up custom detection rules, um, that is again, you can create rules and you can actually create them based on audit logs in the new investigation tool that was recently released. You can go to a log, select it, uh, and say to create a, an alert for that log and choose which conditions in that log. So if you want to detect a login from a certain IP address, um, a login, occurring at specific times, uh, a file being shared to specific people, et cetera. And there's also, you can create like email detection rules. So if you've ever done email security and logged into a security appliance and done like a regex match for an email, like you're receiving a specific um, mouse spam campaign and you can do a keyword match to block those. Google allows the same capabilities built in from Gmail, free with your Google Workspace subscription of any level. Um, so it's worth taking advantage of that. And then lastly, this is a bit more advanced in the sense that it will require um, more configuration, um, potentially higher subscription levels, or things such as that, you could ship the logs to your simmer, uh, sim or log analysis tool. Um, GT, you can actually ship, if you have the, the right subscription level, you can actually ship your Google Workspace logs to GCP. And then from GCP, if you use GCP, do whatever with those logs. Um, in 4509, um, we reference a public a, a script we've released publicly um, that will allow you to export logs to a CSV um, or, or JSON. And then we've actually set it up so that uh, Phil Hagen has provided us with a Google Workspace parser for SoftElk. So if you're using SoftElk as a free SIM, Elasticsearch can parse those logs. And so there's a few methods to get those. A lot of the premium SIMs will have connectors typically based uh, around the Google Workspace API. And of course, then from a SIM or log analysis tool, you can perform more thorough um, reviews, alerting, et cetera, depending on your configuration. And so that's about it to wrap up. Um, I do have a couple questions in the chat, so I'll start with those and feel free to add on more questions as we're ready, to, as you'd like. Um, sorry, let me move this out of the way. Okay, perfect, they were just like. Okay, so first one is from James. Yes, where can you find the log listing for third-party app access for each user? Um, I'm gonna throw my contact information up after this call, I can't remember off the top of my head where um, it is in the UI, but I can send you research that and send you where. Um, I do have a link I will drop quick if I can type it in there that talks about how to control those apps and there's a review it 
and it says that if you go to security API controls under app access control, you can see the current number of configured and accessed apps, and then you can manage it. So I'd visit that link I just dropped you. Uh, second question from Nicole, she says, our security compliance team doesn't have access to the Google admin console, but would like to review alerts and logs. What do you recommend? Can this data be exported to share standalone, not to SIM? Um, that's another great question. I know you, there's a lot of roles and permissions you can use in the organization. So I believe there's a configuration with roles that could add um, like a security view only, for example, so that you can access that review uh, of alerts and logs without having access to the whole organization, which as a security compliance team, um, I believe the business justification for that is there. You should be able um, to, to, to convince your organization to at least give you that restricted access. Again, once you, I have my contact information on the screen, I'll throw it up now, might as well have it up so you guys can copy it. Um, you get, you're welcome to reach out and I'd be happy to work alongside you more to figure out the best solution. I, I don't have an exact solution off the top of my head. Um, you can export the data though, just as a simple download. I think that's what you mean as standalone in your second question. There's export to CSV buttons um, on the dashboards. I'm pretty sure there's export reports too. Uh, so if you cannot do a role-based permissions, uh, hopefully you can hit download on that. Steven asks, does Google offer a way to flag outsiders in shares or is it a purely human process? Uh, if you mean flags in terms of alerting, if there's not all, if there's control of sharing, so you could set, just restrict it, um, don't allow sharing outside. Otherwise, you should be able to create custom rules, like I mentioned, choosing a log or just from scratch, creating a search for basically um, outside organized, you know, Google share was shared with non-enterprise user, alert me. So if you, you can't uh, choose to delete it, then go ahead. Ah, outsiders, I, I mean like, the weird folder not normally shared using NLPers. I'm not sure there's any, I've never seen a machine learning um, or anything in terms of like suspicious drive activity um, uh, using natural language processing or anything like that. Um, so uh, like, I'm, I, I presume you mean like a finances folder shared publicly or something like that. Um, as far as I'm aware, there is no, nothing like that. Um, obviously Google has to partially balance uh, uh, the business uh, impact and stuff. But um, as far as I'm aware, there is not. Carlos asks, does Google Workspace backup tools be a use case for Google Takeout? Do they use other time? Yeah, so I mean, that's partially, um, I suppose, the, the idea of Google uh, Takeout. So um, if your organization, for example, is switching from Google Workspace to um, another platform, um, or maybe there's a legal investigation of some sort and you need to, um, uh, you need to get rid of, I mean, give, give over all that data, then that probably is a use case. But like I said, um, that seems like very edge case. It doesn't seem like a daily capability used. So I still recommend disabling it then as an admin, if that access is required, temporarily using it to get the data you need. Um, disabling it, it doesn't turn off forever. So you have to think about the amount of use. George, similar question, refining where to view files with public access permission. Great tip to reduce the number of files. Um, I'm going to, so that link, I answered it in the answers, but in case you wanted that link to, let me drop it quick in the full chat. That way anyone can drop it. And that link, again, um, is about like third-party access. Um, uh, but that you asked about viewing files with public access. That is in the admin portal in reporting section, if uh, the usage section, I think it's called. Um, so same thing, 
Google helps if you just Google Google Workspace um, file access, uh, file sharing admin or something like that, you'll be able to see um, which which files are being shared and where. Again, there's a usage page that gives you pretty um, dashboards and you can reach out if you're not able to find it and I'll tell you where. Uh, Elias says, does it make sense to set up the explanation of monthly review and reach out to folks who shared with anyone with the link can view and as a template? So I'd say, Elias, that is a business to business situation. Um, it depends how many users you have. If you're in an enterprise with 40,000 users and you see that anyone with link can view appears 300 times, um, then probably not feasible to consistently reach out. Um, but I would say that like it, it should be a monthly review at least to for your security team to review and then maybe reach out if something seems suspicious. If you have a small organization of you know 10, 20 people and there's only three or so files a month shared that way, then yeah, maybe it's part of your process. It all depends like what you think the risk is um, and, and how feasible it is with your staff. Is it two IT people who do all IT for all the org and um, wear all the hats? Or do you have a dedicated security team who have downtime in which they can do that? So that's, that's a per organization answer, unfortunately. Clark asked about, um, whether you'll be sent the recording. Um, Viv, I believe you can, oh, okay. Carol actually answered that in the chat. Oh, she, uh, you can go to my webcast. I think that's where the recording's found. Did um, Carol or Viv, did one of you wanna chime in and answer about accessing the recorder quick? I can do that. Yes, uh, so you, uh, the recording is going to be available after and the same link that you're accessing right now. So under your um, portal account. Okay, perfect. Um, and then Nathan just said an FYI that they, they have a backup process that leverages um, to back up people who are leaving. Um, they use Google Takeout to archive the data, um, but they now have archive licenses removed, so they don't need to do that anymore. Um, but that is true. Uh, like I said, there. I guess I suppose there are use cases for takeout backup is a use case, um, but it's determining whether um, having it enabled permanently is worth the risk um, of having it enabled permanently. Um, but if you do it frequently enough, maybe so. When we tested the DLP feature, as we are in financial service, we are overwhelmed with the number of alerts we received. What would you advise in this scenario to prevent data loss? Uh, part of it's tuning, uh, Bishal, Bishal, sorry if I got your name wrong. Um, part of it's tuning, um, trying to uh, restrict your rules to where uh, you see the important ones, um, but don't get overwhelmed. Um, Unfortunately, yes, that's part of DLP. If you're looking for phone numbers or something um, that is commonly appears in files, you may get alerts. So maybe it's like, okay, well, it was too noisy because we enabled phone numbers as a keyword and we're mostly okay with phone numbers. Let's just look at password numbers or something like that. Um, again, unfortunately, it may be the case that the impact to the business of the number of alerts is too much. If you've got a security team of two people and it's just not feasible and data loss is low on your priority list of tasking, it might not be something that's feasible for your organization. Um, I'm very, very, uh, have strong opinions on the threat model and choosing how you defend your organization, which procedures you put in place based on what your team can handle. So maybe your organization isn't at the stage that you have the staffing for DLP. So um, I would say tune if you can. Um, and then if I'd say leave the alerting on, even if you can't keep up with all the alerts, that's where, while I say DLP in the prevention phase to prevent that data loss, if you can't use real-time alerting to prevent or detect, use it for response. Um, 
when you found out something was exposed, would you rather have that alert um, that tells you that what data was exposed? Or let's say you found out that um, a file was shared. Um, you know, we're looking at a data exposure place. Uh, uh, sorry, data exposure case. Then you could cross correlate with those DLP alerts and say, oh, look, there's a DLP alert, that file that was stolen happen to have social security numbers, that's significant. So I'd say don't necessarily disable it if you can um, make in your procedure to enable it and kind of ignore it in a sense. Tyrone asks, can third party and Google takeout settings be adjusted for live specific, uh, be adjusted for specific OUs? Um, that's something else I have to research Tyrone, I believe so, um, I believe. It, it the what settings can be done on an OU basis um, is actually uh, uh, it, it it varies. Um, I do know for the uh, sorry, I do know for the the sharing settings at least you can do it at an organizational user level. Um, so I'd have to look into third party applications and Google Takeout but at minimum, like document sharing can be done at an OU level. Our enterprise team has set up Google sub OUs by department and office. Can we just filter logs to just OUs our team is responsible for? Ooh, that is a great question, Nicole. I've never tried to filter on OUs. I'd have to look at uh, what OUs um, have, uh, what what filters are available on the new, they actually just changed the investigation and the whole search for logging. So uh, if you will shoot me a DM on Twitter and email with my information on the screen, I will get back to you on that as soon as possible. Uh, I should be able to do that within the next couple hours if you're interested in getting the answer to that. Sorry, I don't have it right now. For higher education, there are use cases that make sense. We would like to find a way to apply a settings of specific OUs. Okay, yeah, perfect, Tyrone. Yes, the what settings are done at an organizational user, I don't know um, at my specific, uh, uh, sorry, I don't know specific service for service, um, but there is, let me drop you this link. Um, if you look in the chat, and I'll do it as a response to your question. Um, okay, it doesn't matter. It's it's in the chat. I accidentally dismissed the question. It I gave you a thing that says customize service settings with configuration groups. Um, so there actually is, I see on that page now, an administrator features. And so that says that you can um, do less secure app settings on an OU basis. So I'd recommend going in there and looking at how configuration groups could be used to kind of do those settings at um, the OU level. Where can you check if Google Takeout is disabled? Um, that's gonna be in the admin portal. Um, I mean, I, I presume if you're a user and it's disabled, then you won't be able to find it. Uh, but once again, in the chat and I'll put it in the link, uh, type answer. I just put it as a response to your answer in the chat um, there, that shows you turning it on or off. Um, and so that will tell you where, show you what page to go to to find what the setting is. And um, there's a service status. So. Uh, da, da, da. Let's see. And, and you can also um, adjust takeout for based on like, you can allow people to, let's say export all their emails, but not all their Google drives and stuff like that. Or there's, there's certain services they'll let you do on a uh, per service basis. Okay, I think that's all the question questions answered. Like I said, emails open, Twitter's open. Um, please don't send me marketing or spam to that email, but I like to provide it because I am more than happy to talk about this with anyone anytime. Um, so if you had any questions you didn't want to ask or didn't get to ask, or um, the few of you who I wasn't 100% sure if you want to continue the conversation, then 
that contact information there is available um, for you to use and preferably not abuse, um, but hopefully I'll hear from some of you and I can help you out further. And uh, I'll hand it back to you, Carol, Viv, whoever's closing out. All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Megan, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.